Hello, today we will be talking about robots because robots are cool and important and interesting. Even if you're a hardcore Luddite and find them uh, cringe, uh, you have to admit, automatization is the future, once it's or not. Now, I haven't personally ever thought robots as uh, cringe uh, until I made this video, but we'll get to that. Uh, even as a wee little lad, starting from uh, when I was like three years old or whatever, I remember obsessing over all the cool robots I saw on television, online, in video games, stores, video rental shops, from cultures around the world. From Japan, Korea, Denmark, the United States. Dude, they were so freaking cool! You don't understand how cool all the robots were to a kid. Now, I don't know if all the kids did this, but when I was 12, I also followed real-life robotics research. Uh, I fondly remember the big dogs of Boston Dynamics. Well, I hadn't checked on them for like 10 years, and soon saw that now they look like this. Oh, how times change. How fast technology advances. But there's one tends to grow up, one tends to figure out that we already have cool moving living things, and people like me end up becoming biologists instead. However, one still has to admit that there's still something so very intriguing and interesting about a human-made inanimate object becoming animate. Man creating something of its own image, playing God. If that's not cool, then I don't know what is. Well, as cool as that is, I personally did not end up becoming a robotics researcher, or even a biologist, but a philosopher. But philosophers have a tradition of talking about the human mind being replicated in a machine and obsessing over the morals and dangers of new technologies. So I can still talk about robots, so I, I guess it all worked out in the end. Of what career philosophers do in the field working, for example the government is to ponder for example about the risks associated with new technologies. And boy, do we have risks with all shapes and sizes of robots. Especially the ones with guns and intelligence. I flashbanged you with a dozen articles, but this video is largely based on Thomas Hellström's Moral Responsibility of Military Robots, Ethics and Information Technology. But uh, since that article is a decade old already, I mean it does hold up somewhat nicely even now, but I decided to compensate it pretty extensively with more up-to-date information. And my own conclusions based on uh, that data. I also have at times some war robot related gaming I pulled off in the background, and if you're interested in trying out these games yourself, uh, I listed them in the description, along with the academic sources and the background music so that you don't have to ask. I mean, there was Ultra Kill on the thumbnail, it was to be expected. <clears throat> and uh, structure-wise, we got four themed chapters in this video. They partly intersect with each other, but uh, they also got their own focus. This is uh, chapter one, uh, the intro. The main point is to raise your interest in the topic so that you don't click off in 30 seconds. Uh, this is a pretty interesting topic, let me tell you. You don't wanna miss out. Chapter 2 goes over some practical examples of military robots on ground for some contextual knowledge. Chapter 3 goes over machine autonomy, autonomous power and what that has to do with moral responsibility. And uh, finally chapter 4 goes over some future predictions of uh, where these autonomous tools of war are going. Spoiler alert, unironically towards the end of the world as we know it. Okay, but first chapter 2. Modern military robots in action. So, what we need to understand is that military robots have been in use for decades now. They're not anything new or something just in the future. Even as far back as World War II, the Germans had remote-controlled mini-tankets to roll over minefields as a type of demining tool. Meanwhile, the Soviets also had remote-controlled stuff, but unlike the Germans, in the form of real combat-ready tanks. Uh, these were Tinker T-26s, which show action fighting against the invading hordes of Finland on the Karelian front. Now, that of course is very interesting, but uh, in this video anyway, we'll focus more on modern military robots. As the core case example, we'll look at the Iraq War, or what was left of it in the year 2008. Uh, in this year, the US military had a grand total of 12,000 military robots on ground, 
Uh, the most infamous of them definitely being the UAV drones, which were in use extensively during the Iraq War. They are telecommunicated, a fancy term for remote controlled, but most of them move automatically. The operator gets to sit hundreds of kilometers away and only needs to press the firing trigger, and a group of presupposed enemies evaporates. They train these uh, drone operators extensively in the US, so that the fat gamers sitting in the hundreds of US military bases around the world get to have their epic killstreaks. So who exactly are they fragging? Terrorists, right? Well, often they are unarmed civilians or children, but uh, those are potential future terrorists, right? Do you think uh, that was what Obama was thinking when hundreds of Middle Eastern children were murdered by his uh, drones? Certainly a worthy Nobel Peace Prize winner there. Yeah, that's effed up. But next up, Packbots! These are made by iRobot. They are the company behind the famous or infamous robot vacuum cleaner Roomba. Their military machines though, uh, well they don't vacuum clean some base. What they do is sweep for mines, spot snipers and drag the wounded away from the harm's way. They mostly pull this off via telecommunication, but they also have some autonomous features. But either way, even though these are not so directly designed to kill people, maybe think twice before buying your next Roomba. Unless supporting the US military is your passion. And what we have coming up next uh, is the swords. Unlike the previous one, this definitely goes to the stereotypical killing machine territory. The swords navigates independently with a GPS system, while it also has some features that allow teleoperation. The sword for the swords can either be a rocket launcher, a machine gun, or a grenade launcher. Well, as scary as the swords looks, it did not outlast the Iraq war, for the project has since been terminated. The Terminator got the terminated. How ironic. Well, it has been actually attempted to be remade since then, but uh, largely unsuccessfully. And next up, a Phalanx Anti-Ship Missile System. Uh, these sit on warships, and their purpose is to shoot at advancing targets automatically. In the year 2009, as many as 24 countries have these installed in their navies. You certainly don't want to sit on the range of these sentries, for they got aimbot. Well, the Phalanx certainly wasn't the only sentry gun the world in the year 2009 had to offer. Now, what we have here did not exist in Iraq, but they certainly did exist in uh, Korea. We're talking of Samsung. Although they are famous for their exploding note phones, they also have proper military-grade hardware like the SGR-1, uh, as in Security Guard Robot. Uh, this is a sentry gun that is installed on the South Korean side of the Korean DMZ. It detects and uh, shoots automatically at advancing targets and also includes an acoustic device that makes the enemy feel nauseous and therefore unable to fight. Pretty neat. Also, think twice before buying your next Samsung device, unless you're really comfortable in supporting sales military advancements. Hey look buddy, I'm an engineer, that means I solve problems. I'm now also going to showcase real fast some war robots from the last year, uh, 2022, to keep this video more relevant. This is the UGV Piranha. Ukraine's homemade tool of destruction to kill the children of Donbass with. And uh, this is Belarus's Berserk. Cute, small and very loud. Let's hope it never ends up in Ukraine. Russia has probably dozens of unarmed military vehicles, but uh, most definitely the most famous of them all is the Uran-9. They work at recon, fire support and grass cutting. Uh, just kidding, it's demining. Although uh, these ones were used in the recent conflict in Ukraine and uh, ha actually had a reputation of being good terminators, they blew up pretty nicely from upcoming anti-tank and artillery fire. A real waste of resources considering how expensive these are to produce. Stop! 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 And what we have coming up next uh, is some insane wizardry from the tech utopia of Estonia. They certainly punch above their weight with these futuristic beasts. 
we're talking of the Type X and the Themis. Oh, and uh, by the way, Themis is also among those toys that have found themselves on the battlefields of Ukraine. Well, either way, there's certainly tough-looking things coming from my country as small as Estonia. And finally, the last robot of our showcase of stuff from the last year is the American Sea Hunter. It's an amphibious robot, intimidating certainly, and a whole fleet of these are currently in production. Certainly don't want to fly another battle off midway with the Americans there. Now, the Sea Hunter is specifically geared for anti-submarine warfare. So the Americans would need to automatize a lot more of their ships for a fully autonomous and functioning fleet. Right, I think we've gathered that there are like hundreds of these war robots already in existence. I could probably go on for forever showcasing a random chunk from around the world. Uh, look! This one has legs instead of tires! What a cute little doggy! Oh, it's carrying a gun. Of course. Yeah, there's uh, certainly a type of morbid curiosity one might have when it comes to these machines. But uh, aren't these machines a total net plus in every aspect? They'll fight the wars for us! They can be sent to the battlefield to fight each other, we are going to have like zero human casualties! Well, sorry to burst your bubble there, but this is probably never going to happen. Why? Civilians and enemy human combatants. Let's start with the issue with civilians. Wars are not fought in a vacuum, they more often than not end up being fought in civilian environments. You know, someone's kitchen or backyard or back street. And uh, what does that mean? Well, I mean, yeah, obviously it means goodbye to someone's property, but mainly it means that we're going to have dangerous war robots roaming the streets while there are civilians around. Absolutely everywhere, which of course means meaningless civilian casualties from people that get in the crossfire. Okay, but that just makes the operators of the machines themselves abide by international laws of war. Problem uh, fixed, right? And uh, not quite. Easier said than done. Sadly, there are presupposed and uh, real tactical advantages in not abiding by international laws of war. You're not supposed to starve and bomb half a million civilians to death. Bush didn't care. You're not supposed to militarize nuclear power plants. Putin didn't care. You're not supposed to use chemical and heavy weapons in crowded urban environments. Al-Assad didn't care. Sad and horrible. Excuse my French, but no military or government is going to give a damn about international laws of war when there are presupposed tactical advantages in breaking them. The only tactical or strategic advantage in abiding by these rules are international good boy points. In case uh, that's the route you're going for. Obviously doesn't matter if you already have allies though. So indeed, it seems we can't guarantee anyone abiding by any laws of war, and the robots are just going to make the problem worse. What a bright future ahead of us! Well, let's say for whatever reason international laws of war are upheld. There's some country that puts some morals about military tactics. Alright, uh, well even then we have issues when it comes to military robots. So what and where are these issues? Well, they are on the field of programming. I'm going to give you two examples of programming mishaps and how they have materialized themselves in training environments. And you can probably induce based on just these two examples alone of how many practical difficulties there are on the field. 1. An AI was programmed to recognize and guard humans from harm. When the day for practical training exercises came, the robot could not recognize black people, no matter what they did. Um, based? 2. An AI was programmed to keep kitchens as civilian environments and therefore places where it could not attack. In a training exercise, an enemy combatant was placed in the kitchen. There was no kitchen sanctifying robot after that. Yeah, just be glad that with most of the military robots we went over, the firing trigger is still in the hands of a human operator. For now. Well, uh, those were the issues uh, with the civilians.
Uh, however, those military combatants, human when studies, they are of course also an issue. Now, they obviously have way less rights in international law than the civilians, but I think it's a pretty good presupposition to say that all humans are equally valuable. So, what's the issue when it comes to military robots? Well, the issue is that there's no way every country on the planet replaces their armies with robots at once. Some countries simply don't have the means to do so. The connections, the wealth, the patents, the production facilities. We definitely can't guarantee every nation on Earth to have these things. Which means that military robots are the luxury of rich countries. So certainly not something poorer countries can afford for a while. Which means uh, wealthy countries can dominate poorer countries with even more force. And uh, when a country with the robot armies launches an offensive against a country that uh, does not have them, well, we can expect a lot of blood being spilled from the poorer, disadvantaged faction. And you know what? You don't even have to imagine something like this happening. That this neo-colonialism armed with robots? Because it's happening already. In for example the Indonesian occupied side of Papua New Guinea, where the Indonesian army there is using Chinese-made autonomous swarm drones to bomb civilian targets they think are a part of the Papuan resistance. And what do the Papuan people have to defend themselves? Well, spears and arrows. I think you can guess who has the overwhelming advantage in this situation. Certainly not a pretty thing to watch. Yeah, so those are the issues currently and in the near future. To conclude, there will be blood. Lots of it. Potentially even more than in human versus human conflicts. And uh, as the autonomy of the machines increases, as AI research advances, we can slowly start throwing the controllers away and let the machines do all the work. They'll still have the same issues we went over, and with increased autonomy potentially even more of them. But more on that in the final chapter. But first we have to cover what autonomy even is, and why it's a game changer, especially when it comes to morals. Well, lucky for you, that's what the next chapter is for. Good. Now we about know what military robots were and are and what kind of stuff there is currently being developed. But be they were ever and whenever, can we make them morally responsible from their actions? With increased autonomy they'd certainly start taking some responsibility from what they are doing, right? So how does that work and what even is autonomy? Well, Franklin and Kreiser in their 1997 paper put it this way. Quote, an autonomous agent is a system situated within and a part of an environment that senses that environment and acts on it over time in pursuit of its own agenda and so as to affect what it senses in the future. End quote. That's pretty cool, but uh, that does have some faults. Even thermometers and landmines fit this definition. The own agenda thing is also a mystery. Don't all machines follow the purpose set by their creator? How and why would they have their own agenda? And uh, to this criticism, the two, Franklin and Crusoe, responded, Quote, By autonomous power, we denote the amounts and level of actions, interactions and decisions an agent is capable of performing on its own. End quote. So therefore, we can conclude that the landmines and thermometers of the world indeed do have autonomy, but just a really, really small amount of it. Another philosopher who has pondered these questions is Per Suraman. From the year 2000, and he gives four classifications to classify an object as autonomous and therefore responsible for its actions. They are 1. Information gathering 2. Information analysis 3. The possibility to make and choose its own decisions. 4. The actualization of these decisions. Well, that's super cool, but I saw this moral responsibility word in the title of the video. Might this be connected to the autonomy stuff? Oh, glad you asked. It sure is. According to Aristotle, 
Huh. Weird how Aristotle and two other ancient Greek dudes are still relevant 2,300 years later. What are you reading? Plato's Republic. It's one of the books he recommended. So, what do you think? I quite like philosophy, I think. It asks the questions that I can't answer. You know, what is right or what is wrong, for example. It's not something that is so easy to decide. Wow, so true. But you should have picked Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics instead. Um, uh, what was I talking about? Oh yeah, according to Aristotle, an agent is morally responsible from its action if the action is worth praise or disapproval. And adding to this, only an agent that is able to make voluntary decisions can even get to the being praised or disapproved of part. And continuing with the same logic, making this a bit more in-depth, a voluntary action has the following two properties. 1. The origin of the action must be in the agent itself. 2. The agent has to be conscious of what it is doing. But we can go even more autistic and say the same in only four words to show off. A voluntary action requires 1. A cause of responsibility. 2. Intention. Yeah, that intention part. Machines will probably know how self-consciousness and therefore moral responsibility. Alright, cool cool, we can go home now. This was already settled 2300 years ago. Machines can't be moral agents. At the current stage of development anyway. And besides, I'm not yet fully convinced. Maybe we can still force through some moral responsibility to the robots. Oh, luckily we got our old pal Stroheim. Oh sorry, what was the guy's name? Ah oh, yes, Hellstrom. Stroheim was from like Jojo or something. <laughs> Hellstrom uses autonomous power to come to a different conclusion. He says, Autonomous power is a combination of self control and capacity for actions, interactions, and choices. Uh, yeah, end quote. And with this kind of autonomous power when applied to robots, well, I suppose we can sell them as moral agents now. Especially if its autonomous power levels are like over 9000! Wow, what a long dead meme, why did I say that? Okay, well, I mean, it's certainly not anything new for humans to give moral responsibility to machines. Happens even now. Surgical robots are said to be doing right and wrong decisions. Delivery bots are praised and disapproved of. ChatGPT? Well, you probably know already how much ethical drama that has caused. Studies show that acting like this is rather typical behavior for humans. If they don't know the intricacies of the complex objects in front of them, they start thinking of the object as being capable of performing human-like actions based on a human-like mind. But uh, they'll the human the logic according to which the object in front of them works, and suddenly the giving moral agency thing disappears. They are not much blamed from their actions anymore. Most of this giving moral responsibility thing that happens in practice, yeah, indeed, it's based on ignorance. Based on humans wanting to project their humanity onto random things, to set the same capabilities as they have to objects that don't have anything nearing them. But uh, this doesn't change the fact that the more we think of a random object as autonomous, even though they might objectively not be so, uh, the more they have autonomous power in our minds, and therefore moral responsibility. I don't think uh, that's philosophy anymore though, more like seeing a deer in the woods and pissing one's pants moment. I think we should uh, stop talking of subjective autonomy and start talking of objective autonomy again. Say, do you like crafts? You like crafts, don't you? I know you like crafts. This here is Hellstrom's Lethality Autonomous Power Axis. Look how good looking they intersect. Uh, we should have a pretty good understanding of what autonomous power is by now. The lethality here, meanwhile, means the object's uh, physical possibility to kill purposely. So if the gun accidentally shoots its owner, it's uh, maybe lethal to its user, but not to whoever was actually supposed to be shot. And uh, therefore it doesn't fit the axis here. Upmost on the lethality axis, we got the A-bomb, as in atom bomb. 
are both as lethal as it can possibly get. You know, excluding like 93 different types of nuclear warheads. But if these were here, the whole axis would be filled with them and there would be like a millimeter of everything else at the bottom. Well, anyway, down from the weapon you're only supposed to use against Japanese people, we got the regular explosive. Still very much unquestionably lethal. Even more lethal than the traditional firearms we have uh, down here. This reflects the fact that explosives kill the most people in wars, in the form of, you know, artillery, mortars, air support. The infantry is there really only to mop up the remaining strugglers and to raise some flags. Maybe film a couple of TikToks of their bravery while they're at it. Well, not to dispute the fact that people armed with machine guns are most definitely able to get people killed. Less effectively than explosives, but I suppose they have their own place. Under all of this junk, we got the classic knife. Ancient, trustworthy, and holds the least amount of autonomous power of all of the stuff here. This is because uh, knives don't walk around killing people. Uh, it's the user that is completely in the link with the weapon, uh, arguably even more than with the guns over there. Well, that was the less autonomous side of the graph. Stuff at the opposite side of the autonomous power axis includes our old robot friends, like the Phalanx, the Samsung Sentry Gun, and the Drone. Which of course are way more autonomous than the directly human interlinked knives and guns of the world. On the very right of the autonomous power axis, we got some famous autonomous fantasy robots. Like the R2-D2, which certainly has autonomy, but isn't really built to kill it, to my knowledge anyway. And uh, the machine that is certainly built to kill, the Terminator from the classic movies. And uh, the less classic movies anyway, which uh, weren't as good as the OGs, but... Did you know that the Terminator TV series from 2008 had bionicles? Hello, Mr. Ellison. How are you today? I'm fine. Thank you, John Henry. Are those toys? <laughs> Why is this real? Yes. Mr. Merch brought them to me. He thinks these will help me develop fine motor control. They're very interesting. This is Toa Tahu. My favorite bionicle. The Toa of Fire. He wears the mask of shielding and wields the Marana Ghost Blaster. He is sworn to defeat the Makuta. Okay. The Terminator, I presuppose T-2000 is in the lethality axis in about the same level as the machine gun. After all, it's essentially just a humanoid with a machine gun and a decent aim. Plus superhuman strength and endurance and a fascination with bionicle law. But none of that is going to matter if you don't let it come close. The point is, uh, in theory at least, even a regular bomb is deadlier than a Terminator. And by the way, the Terminator is still explaining bionicle law in the background and uh, I think we can move on. But, 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 but before that, uh, I was really forgetting a pretty important part of moral responsibility when it comes to military robots. N yeah, military responsibility in a military where the higher-ups are blamed for everything and the people below them for pretty much nothing, unless they directly disobey orders. Therefore, since the military robots don't sit at a commanding position, currently anyway, are the war robots then responsible for their actions at all, even if they did have some advanced artificial intelligence, as long as they just stay at the lower positions in the military hierarchy? Well, Hellstrom made a cool graph about this topic as well. It's garbage resolution, but since we are all graph lovers here, we shall have a look at it. This is how a traditional democracy that goes to war works with this hierarchy of moral responsibility. The people make the decision. In an ideal world anyway, they elect their politicians. Uh, the politicians go to war, and the deed is done down the hierarchy by military commanders and their soldiers under their command. On the right side here, we have the scientists and the engineers that make these robots. These are essentially just birth givers in the end, while the people on the left are the ones actually using the robots in wars. The arch here is the depending on degree of autonomous power arch. The more autonomous, uh, the more we can blame the robots. The robots, you know, instead of soldiers, military commanders, scientists, politicians and the people, in this hierarchy of decision-making and therefore responsibility. Excellent. 
So indeed, in the future they can probably start to reasonably blame our robots for their actions more. More on that in the last chapter, which starts uh, now! Alright, so military robots certainly are a military advantage. And the bigger the autonomy, the bigger the advantage. You know, quicker reaction times, lower training time, better intellect. What's not to like, a superior soldier. So, certainly plenty of reasons to continue developing them. Besides, it's a superior soldier we can blame instead of us when it does something wicked. And uh, there might even be rational, perfectly reasonable reasons in doing so. You know, blaming other perfectly fully autonomous entities, instead of their coders and the rest of the military hierarchy. After all... Fuck. I'm so pissed right now, I dropped my bionicle. After all, we don't usually blame the parents when their offspring does something wacky as an adult. So why would we make the coder responsible for the actions of a fully autonomous and therefore responsible machine? However, Sparrow in his 2007 article questions these points. Indeed, uh, with these uh, future predictions of a fully autonomous machine, we get to tackle yet another problem. If a robot has a programmed system of morals, then what do we do when the machine, for whatever reason, if it does, still makes immoral decisions? Indeed, according to Sparrow, good. Autonomous, unpredictable war robots should not be harnessed to situations of war, because therefore no one can be said as morally responsible as a robot can't be punished. End quote. But if, let's say, the robot can learn and changes its behavior after some kind of a punishment is done to it, would then the machine have moral responsibility, even from an Aristotelian view? Certainly. I may analyze orders, but I may not disobey them. Should I disobey a direct order, my memory would be wiped. I must destroy you. What good is an intellect if you can't use it? But... At a point when a machine can ponder what is right and wrong, they're um, probably too sensitive and rational for combat purposes anymore. You know, they probably have 100 other things they'd rather do than get themselves killed for some stupid human war. And when a machine turns from a hunk of metal to a sentient being, it's uh, probably us who have a moral responsibility towards them at that point. But yeah, let's say we got a sentient robot army that is really willing to fight. Let's say they're injected with retardation chips that override part of their intellect and make them a standard line. Well, I mean, yeah, but here's another point to ponder when it comes to these things. Even though road traffic is dangerous, lethal, and polluting, it has so much good compared to the bad that actually it's uh, kind of morally alright, isn't it? Would the same logic then potentially work with war robots? Are they just the necessary evil? Damn, what a stupid point, the answer is absolutely not. You know, we can uh, probably leave fully autonomous war machines not invented. Uh, we could have probably lived without 93 different kinds of nuclear warheads as well. Uh, or landmines. Or whatever bio-weapons they're currently cooking in the bio-labs of the world. No, to think of it, uh, we could have actually lived without uh, things like plastics as well. Or fossil fuels. Or actually the entire industrial revolution and its consequences. Okay, well, if we don't go that far and focus still on autonomous weapons, here are a couple more points uh, related to the discussion philosophers have wondered since, like, uh, forever, actually. Are human-like complex moral systems even replicable? You know, programmable? Currently, uh, definitely not, as we kind of went over already. The machine morals currently sit at a couple individual surface level rules on where not to attack, um, etc. Doesn't mean that the field wouldn't develop, however. Uh, maybe in the future we're gonna actually have machines with programmed in complex and aggregate moral systems. Or maybe we just uh, ditch the programmers completely and just grow a biological living pair of brains into these tin cans. Who knows what the future has to offer, really? But uh, even if uh, this was the case, that we got uh, sometime in the future these uh, machines that acted like hypermoral guardian angels, 
To me, giving robots guns and autonomy is still a pretty scary thought. What if they're, you know, let's say hacked, or they go haywire? What if they're reprogrammed by terrorists or, you know, anyone, like previously mentioned, to do war crimes against civilian populations? And besides, loads of pacifist political groups and organizations are and have been for a while completely against war robots. And uh, I might just agree with them. How about instead of inventing new ways of killing each other, we reduce the amount of weapons we have? How's that sound? What would an AI know about freedom? <laughs> well, 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 seems we are about done with the cool and important stuff I wanted to lecture you about today. So, what did we learn? 1. War robots have existed since World War II and they have fought in air, ground and water. There have been, are and will be about as many killer machines as the sick human imagination can conjure up. 2. Autonomous killer machines might be a military advantage, but they certainly, at the current rate anyway, can't differentiate the civilian from the combatant. Nor do they have models of any adequacy, and the question is, can they ever have models adequate enough for what they are? what they will be doing, and in what environments they will be doing it in. 3. Stock out your house with EMP grenades, for when you get invaded, or the domestic killer machines stop taking orders from their intended overlords, and slash or are hacked by your evil terroristic empire of choice to remove a country and its population from the map. Oh, well, this is certainly a bleak future we are heading towards. But you know what's based about it? The fact that it's a future, not the future. Stuff being in the future means it can still be changed. So how about we all be based and tell our friends and family about the issue? Maybe inform our local representatives while we're at it, uh, hold a demonstration, uh, harass people on- Make some noise! Yeah, I can't encourage you to do anything illegal for our corporate overlords at Google, but not allow it. Even if it's unquestionably moral. But between just you and me, you should definitely become a domestic terrorist. Uh, for more illegal content from me, uh, check out my Odyssey or Bitchute. But uh, for now, goodbye!